Wow, what an amazing introduction. I am so honored to be presenting today at the Aussie Way Australian Accessibility Conference 2020. Like she mentioned, my name is Dax Castro. I am an Adobe certified PDF accessibility trainer. I do run a PDF accessibility Facebook group and we have tons of great members there and we'd ha be happy to have you as well. You can always reach me at accessibility at jacobs.com. My passion is document accessibility and I try to do it in three different ways, promoting awareness, education, and implementation. So today's session is understanding document accessibility. So let's dive right in. So first we need to understand the Disability Discrimination Act. This is a federal act, the DDA, created in 1992 that was protect, the, the idea behind it was it was to protect people from with disabilities from discrimination. So each state and territory of Australia also has other legislation that is anti-discrimination and, and, and equal opportunity to prohibit discrimination, uh, discriminatory treatment of people with disabilities. All that to say that the idea behind the goal of DDA is to eliminate as far as possible, and this is straight from their website, discrimination against persons on the grounds of disability and to ensure as far as practicable that persons with disabilities have the same rights to equality before the law and the rest of the community and to promote recognition and acceptance within the community of the principles that persons with disabilities have the same fundamental rights as the rest of the community. So really it boils down to three key points. Eliminate discrimination, ensure same rights, and promote recognition and acceptance within the community, right? So this is the heart and foundation of why DDA is so important. So uh, in uh, 2010, the Australian government released the Web Accessibility National Transition Strategy. And along with that, the Digital Standard Services uh, release this poster, which are the 13 uh, guiding principles for them for clear and fast service. And you can see that number nine says, ensure the service is accessible to all users, regardless of their ability and environment. So what is the standard? So we understand accessibility. Everybody wants to be accessible. We have to be accessible. What's the standard? Well, the web content accessibility guidelines are the adopted standard. So federal, state, and territory websites must contain content. Now, initially there was a rollout plan, right? So in 2010, they said, yes, we want to be compliant. They said by 2012, we want to be WCAG 2.0 level A compliant, which is a good, a good start. And then by 2014, the end of 14, the beginning of 15, they wanted to meet the double A level. And if you go on their website right now, it, it currently states that they really uh, are urging you to, to try to be WCAG 2.1 AA compliant, although it's not a mandate at this point, expect that it will be, especially since uh, WCAG Silver, which is the next iteration of the web content accessibility guidelines, is actually going to be released coming up sometime in 2021, uh, if my sources are correct. The, the founding principles of the web content accessibility guidelines all stem from four key pillars. They're called the poor principles, and we're going to talk about what those are in a moment. There are 13 major guidelines, and they have 50 criteria that make up the A, AA, and AAA. And I will tell you that you probably will never see a document that is required to be AAA compliant, but if you do try to make a document AAA compliant, realize because of the nature of the requirements, you're not going to be able to click to check every single box for compliance for AAA. AAA documents are specialized and they're for specialized audiences. And so therefore, some of the requirements compete with other requirements. So there's no way to make it completely perfect. But AA is our standard. And there is there are ways to make your document AA compliant. And we're going to talk about what those are. So like I mentioned, the basic principles of WCAG are the poor principles, and they are perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And perceivable is, can I detect it? Can I see or do I know, do I have access to the information that is on the screen? Can I get to the header? Can I get to the paragraphs? Can I get to the images? Do I have access to the footnotes, right? Operable is, can I navigate to it? Can I move from item to item? Now, an eye tracker works more like a mouse, but almost every other assistive technology uses a keyboard trigger of some sort. So that's why you hear so often that they must be keyboard accessible because whether or not there's an actual keyboard involved, 
the, the assistive technology device they might be using is going to be using a series of keyboard triggers, down arrow, left arrow, tab, enter, shift, control. All of those can be uh, mapped to things like a sip and puff device, maybe a stomp pad that only has two or three buttons on it. Those types of things need the keyboard access only. Understandable. Can I understand it? Is a heading labeled a heading? Is a list a list? It would be unfair for someone to be able to understand a complex document structure uh, because they have sight, but yet myself as a, as a person using a screen reader or using an assistive technology device wouldn't have access to that. To me, maybe it would be a bunch of just paragraphs, just one paragraph right after another because someone didn't take the time to properly tag it. And finally, robust. Do I have the option to read the document my way? Remember, a story might be read from beginning to end, but I bet you've never sat down and read a magazine or a technical manual or a flyer starting at the beginning and moving through each different piece. You're gonna thumb through it. You might look at the headings, you might look at the pictures, you might look at the links. Now, assist, people using assistive technology have that same type of, of, of want. They want to be able to go through the document in a way that suits them. So am I identifying all those pieces so that they have multiple ways via a bookmark or a table of contents or a list based on their assistive technology? And we're gonna talk about how they do that. So why is document accessibility so unique? What makes it different from HTML accessibility? We have headings and paragraphs, lists, color, images, tables, footnotes, hyperlinks, TOC and bookmarks, all of these things all exist in both a PDF or a document environment and in a web environment. So what makes PDF uh, or documents uh, different? Well, we control the underlying definition. In HTML, the only way you can specify a heading is by actually coding it as a heading. A list as a list, an image is an image. There's no other way to insert an image into an HTML document without declaring the right tag. But inside a PDF document or inside a Word document or any other desktop publishing program, you have multiple ways of identifying what those are. And so as creators, it is our responsibility to purposefully designate what each element is. Now, I will say that, of course, a lot of these programs do most of the heavy lifting for you if you just use the tools that are there by using the list tool or using the heading tool or, um, you know, insert image, those types of thing. But if you go in and you manually create bullets or you're manually highlighting over text and making it bigger or smaller, then you are you are not using a purposeful intent to designate each item. So let's take a look at an example. Which one here is the imposter? On my screen, I have this is my heading image on the left and another version of this is my heading image, my heading on the right. They look virtually identical to someone cited, but if we uh, take a look at the underlying code, you can see that tags, the, the underlying content makes a difference. And the item on the left is properly tagged as a heading one. And the item on the right is actually improperly tagged just as a paragraph, right? So, so this is a, and, and hopefully a really simple way to kind of show you that tagging does make a difference. Let's, let's actually take a look at a, a real life example of uh, why structure matters. So let's, let's go ahead and move over to my Acrobat document here. And we can see in this Acrobat document that we have a title here at the top. And so what we're looking at here is a page that has the a, a logo at the top. There's a masthead with an image in it. It has a heading that says cultural resources. It's a two column layout. There's a list of bullets in two columns. And then on page two, there's another two column layout with a sidebar. There's lots of different elements on this screen. We've got three different images going on here on the left. But if we go back up to the beginning and we look at the underlying structure in the tags tree, you can see that we have a figure here for the logo. You have a figure tag for the masthead image, right? And then we have cultural resources, which visually is a heading, but in our tags tree, it's just listed as a paragraph tag. And so is this subheading, which could be listed as a caption if it was a caption to the photo above.
right? And then of course here we have the actual paragraphs and we go down and, but now we're on, it skipped over some of the content and now we're on page two and it still says paragraph for what is obviously a heading and paragraph again. So basically this entire document is really a bunch of paragraphs, which to someone who's using assistive technology, none of the visual structure that we get to have are they being able to access. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. So how is a document measured for compliance, right? We just did a little bit of that where we started walking the tags tree, but an automated checker isn't going to know that that's wrong. So that's why you use a mix of compliant, um, uh, compliance checkers like automated software and manual testing because no checker can guarantee compliance completely on its own. Human testing is a necessity. You have to go in and visually inspect to make sure that headings are assigned as headings, that alt text is meaningful, that your images have specific and relevant alt text, that your footnotes are being voiced correctly. All of these things, no screen reader is going to check and get it correctly. Right. So what are some of the tools that we can use? Well, Vision Australia's document accessibility toolbar, which is a plugin that goes right um, right inside of Word, gives you some of the all of the accessibility features that are really already inside Word, but they give them to you in a nice, neat um, accessibility toolbar that allows you uh, quick access. Right. Then we have Word. Of course, Word has an accessibility checker. Uh, but if you're using a program like uh, InDesign or some other program, you might um, not have that checker. Uh, you might not have access to that checker. So Acrobat has its own accessibility checker. And if you've ever used that checker, you know very well that the accessibility checker inside Acrobat is a starting point. It is not a definitive answer. Just because you pass that checker does not mean that your document is, is compliant. It means that the automated testing tools and items that it's been testing for have met a passing condition, which means it can't check for things like meaningful alt text or that paragraph have uh, the right designation that if a heading is set as the right level. All of those things require that manual check. Now, PAC3 is another accessibility checker, and it checks for an, another requirement called PDF UA. Now, PDF UA is a, um, a more technical uh, compliance uh, level. I wouldn't say it's harder or it's more stringent, but it requires a higher level of um, of of regulation to follow uh, what the PDF UA, the uh, guidelines have set forth. Uh, another tool is called Callus PDF Go HTML. And I use this one to check my tables, right? So this is, tables can be the bane of your existence when it comes to accessibility. And when I'm having trouble and I can't figure out what's going on, I'll use this plugin. It's a free plugin, Callus PDF Go. It generates an HTML styled version of your PDF. And it will show you very clearly, you can, you can see in this image here we have on the screen, there is a table with three columns and four rows, one of which is a heading row. And it clearly shows that the table headings are marked in a high, a, a brighter purple and the table data cells are all marked in a, a lesser purple. It gives you a very clear picture of where you might be missing a cell or when something might not be quite the way you expect it to be. So I find it a very useful tool. The, uh, there are also other commercial programs like Common Look and Axis and Foxit. Uh, those programs will help you get quicker at uh, uh, remediating PDFs and making them more compliant. They have a lot of tools built in for speed so that you can do things. But I will tell you, it is really important, at least in my opinion, that you have a firm foundation of what accessibility is, what the guidelines are, and how to comply with them. Because when those tools don't work exactly the way that they're planned, you need to know, right? You don't want to be using the, the tool you spit out this document you think is compliant. Well, I did all the things inside the program only to find out that there, you've created some accessibility barrier because a tag structure didn't get exported the right way or because some item didn't, didn't come out quite the way you wanted it to. So it's still really important that even though we have access to these tools that speed up our workflow and make things a little easier for us, that we understand the, the uh, remediation principles that we're trying to, to comply with. So screen readers are also tools that are available for us to check our PDF. 
it is one thing to walk through with the tags and going through the tags tree and making sure that you've checked off all the boxes that your document is compliant. It is a whole nother thing to make sure that your document is being voiced in the way you want. And I'm gonna show you some examples of what I mean, but you really need to take the opportunity to test your document with a screen reader. And NVDA is a free uh, screen reader, so really there, there is no excuse. Um, Apple VoiceOver, uh, if you're on a, a Mac, you have Apple VoiceOver, which will give you a very close experience to NVDA, um, but it is a little different. So JAWS is another po most popular screen reader out there. It's right now NVDA and JAWS are very close in in, in popularity. Uh, but if you use one or the other, you're, you're going to be pretty right on with what most people are going to have as a common experience. Now JAWS is commercial, costs I think ninety dollars a, a year, ninety dollars a year I think for for a license. And of course Android has an an, uh, an accessibility feature of its own, uh, which will again give you a different experience. But but really NVDA and JAWS are definitely um, the the, the go-to tools, right? So screen readers, like I said, no reason not to use a screen reader. I implore you, go take a basic class. DQ University has these tip sheets. They've got one for JAWS and one for NVDA, and you really only need to know a couple of shortcut keys to be able to walk through your document, test things like tables, test things, test your list to make sure your bullets are being voiced correctly. Uh, make sure your Roman numerals are being voiced correctly. I bet you didn't know some screen readers don't voice Roman numerals. They don't understand what they are, so you hear IV or IV. Uh, depending upon uh, the screen reader, right? So the uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is some of the pitfalls of testing with a screen reader, right? So the first pitfall is that there should be more than one way to navigate the document. If you don't have this, uh, a varied structure that is appropriate for your document, then you're giving people who use assistive technology a disservice. They're not going to typically walk through the document the way that you would. They might pull up, this is an example of the list of lists, right? This is in JAWS. It shows you, hey, if I want to know, where are, what are all my links? Just show me all the headings. How many graphics are in my document? Does my document have any forms? They're going to inspect this document in a way that helps them give a, a, a sense of what the document structure is like. Right. So if we don't provide identification for all of those elements that are in our document, we're really doing them a disservice. The number two pitfall is meaningful content. Not everything is meaningful. Uh, on the right here, we have a picture of some bubbles. Looks like it's being viewed through a microscope and you can see they're kind of making an intricate pattern. Sometimes this is just a pattern. It's just a, a space filler so that um, you can give an overall sense of what a document is. But sometimes it's not. Let, let's take a look at an example. Let's, let's go back to our, um, our sample document here and let's take a look. So here we have our sample document and let's go to page two, right? Well, let's look at page one. Up here at the top, we have the logo, which is meaningful. You would definitely wanna make sure that that has an alt text description, right? And then we also have this masthead image here at the top. Now this image, let's zoom in a little bit. Our subtitle says, Jacobs employees, highly experienced team of cultural resource professionals stationed across the US to serve the needs of our clients nationwide. Now, that's not describing this picture. This picture is not um, some very specific source being talked about or being referenced in the text below. It's simply there to give the, the, the sense of uh, two people, it looks like maybe they're digging, uh, looking for cultural resources or cultural heritage uh, artifacts in the soil, right? That's not really meaningful in this case. It is a space filler. Now, if it had been referenced down here somewhere in the, in the body copy, then you might want to give it alt text. Let's look at page two. So page two here. Now I know this is a color contrast barrier. These definitely don't meet color contrast. I have, this is a great example document of, of several things that I use at, um, for things that need to be improved. Uh, so here we have a lighthouse, a picture of a man holding, a person holding up a, uh, looks like an artifact of an arrowhead and two people uh, walking on, um, looks like a, in a grassy field and they come upon a, a mound of rocks, right? These are not informationally important images that give, add context to what's being talked about in this body copy. 
the answer, the question usually you ask yourself is, if I removed these items from the document, would the user have lost some type of content, some meaning? And the answer in this case is no, right? So let's go back to our document here, our PowerPoint. So pitfall number two, meaningful content. Not everything is meaningful. Number, pitfall number three, captions versus alt text. Uh, a caption is different than alt text, okay? So a caption can be, in this case, we've got our group of bubbles photo again, and it says groups of bubbles can withstand more pressure than a single bubble alone. And that's the caption. So is that a description of what's in this photo? If you didn't have the photo here, would you know what that is? what that photo was of just based on the caption? No, right? The caption is a supporting statement that goes along with the imagery. Now the alt text for this, and you could debate on what you put in the alt text, but given the this fictitious structure that we're trying to show in this example, my alt text is microscope view of many bubbles sharing cell walls. Because maybe the body copy says, it starts, is talking about how bubbles that are together have a reinforced cell structure because of the fact that they're walls, that they share walls. Um, or maybe not. It's up to you on what you put in for that alt text. But remember, an alt, te alt text is not a caption, and you shouldn't be repeating the, uh, the caption in the alt text. Now, pitfall number four, read order versus tag order. Now, this is a complicated subject in its own, but I will tell you that tag order is the first priority. Um, the web content accessibility guidelines dictate that the tag order is a, a, the uh, develops the primary structure for the document. But WCAG 2.1 also says that your document must be able to be reflowed in a way that maintains reading order. So the read order must also be uh, managed. Both are important, right? And I will tell you, if you've ever tried to set the read order and the tag order, do yourself a favor, set the read order first, and then go set the tag order. Otherwise, you're going to be fighting tags back and forth, right? It is definitely not, not a perfect science at this point. So pitfall number five, screen readers. I hope by this point you have realized that uh, screen readers are a passion of mine. I think it's really important. And not testing with a screen reader means that there's no guarantee that your document is truly accessible. It might be compliant, maybe, but there's no guarantee that it's going to be accessible. You need to test it with a screen reader to make sure that your document is both compliant and creates a usable experience for your reader, right? So let's talk about what that means. So here I have a table and this table has uh, three data, col data rows and three uh, heading columns, fruit, quantity harvested, and season. And you can, uh, it, what's demonstrated here in this table is that apples have a quantity harvested of 50, but it has a superscript one. And pears has a quantity of 60, but it has a superscript two. Now we know we can see in the bottom here, it says number one includes neighboring farms and number two says excludes 15 eaten by neighboring cows. So you might be surprised to know that when a screen reader would try to read this, they would hear quantity harvested, apples, 501. Quantity harvested, pears, 602. A screen reader does not understand at this point in time what a superscript is. It doesn't read it. So you would have to go in and manually create the link for it so that it would hear 50 link one or 60 link two and have it linked to those footnotes. And that's a manual process. Now, when you're creating hundreds of tables inside a long document for Excel or, or um, uh, some other spreadsheet program, this can be a really cumbersome experience that you have to plan for or develop ways to work around. So another thing to remember is dealing with blank cells. Testing with a screen reader is the only way you're gonna know how a screen reader deals with a blank cell. In this table, we have two columns, fruit and har quantity harvested, apples, pears, and peaches in one column, and then several different null values, dash, dash, zero, and NA. But how do we know what a screen reader is going to read? Who wants to hear dash, dash every single time they move from one cell to another? In fact, I created a uh, blog post on section508help.com, uh, which is a blog that I write, 
uh, that actually goes through and talks about what the alternative values are in both NVDA and JAWS when you use different combinations of NA or N.A or, or just the word blank, what happens when you have a blank cell. You know, one of the best ways to approach that is just to put not applicable or no value, right? Even dash. So if you put a dash, JAWS is going to say dash. NVDA won't voice anything, right? Um, in uh, using a blank cell, you'll hear a lot of people say, never use blank cells. Well, JAWS will tell you the, the cell is blank. NVDA just won't, won't read it at all, right? So there's a lot of different things you have to understand and make a decision about what you want the user experience to be. Right. So the summary is ensure that visual tags and the visual and the tag structure match. And not everything is meaningful. Right. Images can be decorative. Captions are different than alt text. And that is a very clear distinction. And the read order is also vital for some screen readers. And finally, testing with a screen reader ensures usability. So how do we build in accessibility? into our documents, right? We don't want to just start with accessibility at the end and go, okay, now it's time to make the document accessible. If we think about it from the start, we can start thinking about things like who's going to write the alt text? Do I have complex tables that I might need to rethink about how I'm uh, structuring those? Am I using styles and structured format? Do I have a heading level structure that makes sense? And am I budgeting time for compliance and test compliance testing and fixing? Because in the end, we all know we'd love it for it to be perfect straight out of the software, but it isn't always that way. So we have to make sure we budget that time. So here are six things that you can do to make documents more accessible without being expert. This is what you can walk away with today. If you knew nothing about accessibility, if you do these things, your documents will be more accessible. So use a logical heading structure, H1, H2, H3, on down to H6. Use tables for data. Don't use them to lay out text. You want two columns, use the column feature inside Word. You want a, a tab set, stop set, set a tab stop. Don't use tables just because it's easy because a screen reader is going to try to read that as if it were a data table like our pears and peaches, right? Avoid using manual, uh, excuse me, keep tables simple. Avoid using merge cells. Now you can remediate merge cells inside a PDF. It is definitely possible. It is complicated or it can be complicated in certain circumstances. So do yourself a favor. Don't use merge cells. Try to figure out a way to create that table where merge cells aren't used and you're going to save yourself headache on the back end, right? Use lists. Avoid manual bullets. That's all I can say. Just keep your bullets simple. Use the dots. Use the squares. Anything beyond that, you're going to start to get into issues uh, where you might hear right pointing pointer as the bullet because that's the name that um, the Unicode symbol has been assigned, right? So never save, uh, excuse me, always save as a PDF and never print to PDF. Saving as a PDF, either using words file save as or using the Acrobat ribbon and using the PDF generator there are going to give you options for creating a compliant PDF. If you print a PDF, it's going to strip out all accessibility. So always save as a PDF, right? So keep your, and the, finally keep your alt text short, two to three sentences, 250 characters, and that's going to really help you because remember, alt text cannot be paused. You can't start and stop. So once you start reading, if they miss something in the middle, they've got to go back and read it again. So in summary, I will tell you, accessibility is easiest when you design for it first you're going to get a much better experience, have a much easier time making sure your documents are compliant by doing the steps in the beginning when you create the document rather than trying to fix it all at the end. And the answer is, it's to start is really simple. Just use the headings, just use the bullets. We talked about what to do, right? But you gotta start now, start today. Don't start, don't say you're gonna start later on because, oh, I'm gonna learn more about accessibility. Just do what you can now. The more accessible your document is, the better off it is than it was, right? So accessibility is a journey. It's not a destination. I'm learning new stuff every single day. I am always learning because the minute you stop learning or, or stop thinking about new ways to create accessible content, you're gonna be left in the dust. Right. And finally, the last thing I will tell you is above and beyond the statutes and requirements, accessibility is the right thing to do. 
So thank you so much. It has been my pleasure to speak at the Aussie Way Australian Accessibility Conference 2020. I'm Dax Castro. I am an Adobe certified PDF accessibility trainer, and I run that Facebook group called PDF Accessibility. I even have a YouTube channel called PDF Accessibility too. And you can always email me at accessibility at jacobs.com. Remember, accessibility is about awareness, education, and implementation. Thank you so much.